So our team is here today to address an issue which could threaten the stability of the United States and the lives and well-being of millions of its citizens. And that issue is the potential for widespread and severe drought in the American West. Okay, so we're presenting this to the Congressional Subcommittee on Ubiquitous Climate Change, or uh, sorry, for Ubiquitous Climate Catastrophe today. And this is our team of experts. This is our team of experts. <clears throat> okay. So scientific research has come to a resounding consensus, and that's that the outlook for drought in the 21st century is stark and grim. Although drought cycles are a natural part of the climate, their severity has been exacerbated by human activity over the course of this century. The worst case scenario that we're facing, millions of households without usable water, includes large loss of life, massive economic instability, and huge social upheaval. <clears throat> Close to home, we must worry about the impact of severe and long-lasting drought to, on the, in the American West, one of the most crucial agricultural regions and a massive population center. <clears throat> to address this, researchers Sheffield and Wood ran statistical modeling using IPCC data to chart future, tr uh, future trends in drought across the globe. Their findings are alarming and clear. The frequency of short-term droughts will increase drastically over the course of this century. And the region of the United States impacted most by this trend is the, is the West. Sheffield and Wood modeling also predicts a similar trend in the frequency of long-term drought that is lasting longer than 12 months, as shown here. Again, the regions most severely affected will be the American West and Midwest, which are both key agricultural centers. There are further statistical tools we can use to predict trends in drought in the oncoming years. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO, and Atlantic Mean Oscillation, or AMO, are indexes that track precipitation patterns across the continent of the United States. Um, oscillating deviations from the average of these indexes are common and appear to be rhythmic. The position of an index above or below its mean can be used to predict drought patterns based on historical data as well as projections. A positive AMO, uh, PDO and AMO index predicts widespread drought, as does a negative PDO coupled with a positive AMO as I've indicated here. In these, in these phases that I've described, vast swathes of the American continent are in drought. Yes. So an extrapolated harmonic can be fit to the raw PDO data and used to track trends and predict future behavior. Note that we are currently entering a period of positive PDO deviation. Likewise, we can fit a harmonic to the AMO data to predict trends. Again, we are entering a period of positive deviation in the index. This overlay of the indexes in illustrates both of their current upward trends. <clears throat> Last time that uh, both indexes were in a positive trend like this, uh, the United States was crippled by the effects of the Dust Bowl. So the situation that we find ourselves in now, um, and will for some period of time in the future, um, is the one of severe drought that I've illustrated here, both in the West and the Midwest. Like the PDO and AMO, we can use temperature to predict trends in drought. A massive survey of 12 centuries of drought history in the West found that temperature is correlated with drought severity, including in ways we cannot even fully predict or appreciate based on the historical record. This means that even though the super droughts of the medieval era may be, this means that even the super droughts of the medieval era may be significantly smaller than anything we will face in the near future. So this is a measure of the temperature change across the northern hemisphere over the last century. You'll notice that there's a glaring upward trend to the data. The fit of this data extrapolated out to the next century predicts massive increases in the surface temperature across the northern hemisphere, a reality which will compound the dramatic effects of already widespread drought. It's also worth noting that this is actually a conservative estimate of the increase in temperature. Many expert predictions show an exponential trend in temperature increase due to positive feedback loops of warming. The same historical survey of drought in the West uncovered evidence of cycles of massive drought, the most severe lasting as much as half a century in blocks spanning several hundred years. The historical evidence for lasting drought offers an accurate predictor for our future, although we must keep in mind that contemporary changes in temperature will likely, likely make future incidents even more severe. Even currently, we are experiencing the first effects of drought in the West. This data shows the percentage of the American West in drought since 2000. Note that since 2010, increasingly large amounts of the West have been in marked drought up to more than 80% of the land. As of last week, 76% of the American West is in lasting severe, extreme, or exceptional drought. 
This evidence forms a clear consensus. Massive, long-lasting, and severe drought will hit the West, and it will likely happen soon. Drought has been linked to the downfall of past cultures which lacked the capacity to respond. We are currently woefully underprepared to deal with such a large drought event, and so must act quickly to reassess our mitigation and response strategies, because the danger of non dangers of non-action are severe. This is not one of the climate change scenarios that we're ever told um, our children or grandchildren will have to solve the issue. We must move to address this issue quickly, because the lives and likelihood of a number of our citizens are at stake. Needless to say, failure of the subcommittee to act to prevent this catastrophe would result in massive loss of constituency support throughout the region. So currently, there are already many regions and counties in California experiencing these severe drought conditions that we're talking about. One example is Tulare County, which is known as ground zero of the drought. There are currently, as of, I think, July, more than 5,000 residents without running water in their homes. There are 1,000, more than 1,000 households relying on bottled water delivery, and they have three water tanks in their town to get non-potable water for like cleaning and various things. And this is because many of the homes in this region have private wells, and the Tool River has now dried up, and there's little groundwater to fill the wells. So these people are living without any running water in our, their homes, which will happen in the future because this drought is supposed to worsen. So we need to prepare for these conditions. Looking at the short-term drought outlook, we can see in the first image that the monthly projection is for the drought to persist and intensify all along the west coast and then moving to the seasonal drought outlook for October through January the drought is still supposed to um, remain and intensify in majority of the west coast but more importantly is looking into the long term there have been many tests and studies to see what the world's going to look like in the future in the drought conditions and this is a study based on projections from several climate models and it compares future drought projections directly to drought records from the past 1,000 years and it is mapping the soil moisture at 30 centimeters below the land surface and as you can see here it gets very dark which means it's going to be very dry all around the U.S. and this is one of the scenarios that they um, projected, which is a business as usual scenario, and it shows the future risk of lengthy droughts rises to 80%. However, they also made the image of if we were to take immediate action and change our ways, reduce our emissions and everything, it's still dry. However, it is significantly less severe as projected if we don't do anything to change. So this just shows that we need to take action to help prevent the drought from happening. And another study was done by a team of climate scientists led by Benjamin Cook of NASA, and they ran computer models to determine the severity of and intensity of drought in the Southwest. And they used the Palmer Drought Se Severity Index and the North American Drought Atlas, as well as soil moisture at two meters and 30 centimeters to show what the drought should look like in the future. And as you can see, between the years 1000 and 1300, the um, graph spends most of the time slightly below the moisture line, and this was the um, mega droughts of the medieval warm periods, and these droughts destroyed entire civilizations. And then moving over to the right side of the graph, the line plummets around the year 2000 and goes down about four times lower than the worst droughts we've seen, and this is their um, projection for the rest of the 21st century and it shows that the future is significantly drier than anything we've ever seen, and these droughts will be the worst that we have on record, even worse than ones in the past that have destroyed entire civilizations. Oops. Um, so, oh, to look back at a historical example of potential, you know, uh, the Mayan Empire's theory I said collapsed due to a drought that was, that was exacerbated by deforestation on their part. Now, looking at economic, the econo looking at, at, at the, mo the um, sorry, the the economic impact of the a dust bowl can be used to uh, to predict what might happen to uh, uh, in future droughts. Um, poor land management resulted in a massive loss of topsoil. 
and the loss of viable and with values in high impact areas declining by as much as 20 percent, and long term agriculture loss estimated to be 1.9 billion in by 2007 dollars, which is approximately the same size as the state of Oklahoma. And the human cost of this is that there is mass migration as as 500,000 people all migrated out of uh, impacted areas, moving to other ur urban areas, and the majority of which went to California. However, this or to, um, this doesn't take into account out the e economic situation of other areas, and in the case of the Dust Bowl, the uh, Great Depression already had resulted in a high unemployment elsewhere. When the refugees reached these areas, that many of the ember became homeless or had to wander around, this resulted in the creation of shanty towns. These places, they are getting the nickname of Hoovervilles after President Hoover, who's considered to be, e many considered to be e the reason behind, many considered to be a failure for not uh, being able to, uh, act. many considered to be a failure for not uh, effectively meeting the, meeting the crisis. In California today, the total cost is estimated to be $4 billion. In dollars. However, in agriculture alone, you know, the numbers may be, may be misleading. California is already one of the biggest agricultural producers, that producers in the U.S., exporting $21.5 billion in 2013. And in spite of $480 million in decline in revenues in 2014, it's, the revenue is still one of the highest in, in history. As you can see, there's a significant in, uh, growth trend that's, that's continued, though it shows signs that it may be declining. And all these efforts to uh, continue this trend and are simply not sustainable. This uh, chart up at the top shows the uh, cumulative uh, ground bar loss. And as you can see, he is declining sharply. As more, more and more people are forced to transfer water or, and rather than use their own. And again, to go back to the human cost and to put a face to those who are suffering, the, the, the impacts of the drought are not felt oh, oh, universally. There are areas that are much, worse of, or much more severely affected. And the, you, this, these images and this story the are taken from an LA they are Times article by Dan, Diane Markham, who visited area communities that were severely impacted. These are areas where uh, the population is, is steadily declining as more and more people lose their welfare and watch the, their means of survival shrivel up and die. One, that, one man uh, that she wrote about was Francesco Galvez, who, who is already behind on his rent and is for, is, may have to move to Texas. This is a family that has to act where the wife feels the need to apologize for becoming pregnant because of the, how bleak their situation is. And while, this sit, and while this situation may seem isolated to the, most, the poorest communities, Eventually, when water runs out and when the effects spread, more and more our communities will, will face the same situation. Okay, so clearly the detrimental effects of the 1930s Dust Bowl did not motivate Americans to change both policy and behavior. So we need mitigation steps at a regional level that are proactive and not reactive to reduce the severity. And when we establish mitigation, we need to continuously share experiences and harmonize data collection and data processing with other nations and collaborate between local, state, and federal governments. So there are three conceived levels where mitigation should be implemented. On the first level is the individual household, which has more of a local effect. The first water usage that should be curtailed is outdoor irrigation. So that's implementing a law by a government that makes landscaping go brown. And in some cities, it can mean, uh, or it can be applied more broadly to golf courses, stadiums, fields, and public spaces like parks. And then the second is rationing household water use. The municipal water system can shut down uh, water in households and limit the flow to certain times of the day um, through utility pipes for most, uh, for both municipal and private buildings, or it can just ration down to a certain amount. Um, most cities even have meters already in place to monitor water use. At a more institutional and agriculture level, we need to change policy by either subsidizing or requiring changed irrigation methods of lower water use. A common improved system is drip irrigation. Law should also require the rotation of crops um, that require lower water use, including livestock. So this could be a change from cattle to other protein sources because cattle require plants and soy products with high water use. A second step for agriculture is shifting what is available to the public and to overseas markets based on drought resistant crops. On a systematic and more national level, it's first important 
to note that the water, the right to take water is through an extremely complex water rights system. So taking a mitigation step that is less immediate but critical to lessen the impact of drought um, on overall water use and water waste is looking at the arcane system of water rights, which is now based on prior appropriation and riparian rights, which leads to water rights holders, particularly irrigation districts and property owners, literally just wasting their water sitting on what they call hobby farms um, just to hold on to their water rights. So particularly in this time of drought, this system has to be redone. As Ian touched on earlier, if we do not implement adaptation, adaptable mitigation, our country will potentially have millions of drought refugees who are forced to reduce, to relocate due to lack of water, whether it's just losing a ton of agriculture jobs or the simple need for drinkable water. And as stated earlier by John and Casey, massive, long-lasting, and severe drought is going to happen, and more severely than ever before, which means we have no idea, we have no prediction on how people are going to act and how our economy is going to act. So it is so crucial that this mitigation is adaptable, which mean it means it caters um, by specific city needs. Okay, so as I begin a discussion about resources, it's important to recognize that drought is not an occurrence that can be recovered from quickly. Droughts are crippling and often span multiple years, and as Casey demonstrated, droughts are only going to become more severe and last even longer um, in the next century. So there's no magic set of resources that will help a large population recover from a drought quickly, especially as their impacts worsen. Um, California is currently in the midst of a drought, and there is, of course, a need for um, reactive resources and procedures. Uh, Casey addressed the case example of Tulare County earlier, a rural area that receives rationed amounts of imported water like water bottles. Um, in crisis, it may also be necessary to provide food baskets to individuals and families that are no longer, no longer able to produce local and regional foods due to um, dry conditions and lack of water resources. And this cushions the impact of drought on a household level but does little to address the larger issue. Um, this is where the discussion of resources needs to shift its lens from reactive to proactive as Zoe mentioned earlier. Um, once we are in crisis of the drought, there's little we can do to effectively meet the public safety needs while also working to conserve water resources that can, could sustain large populations of people who are impacted. Thus, we, need, we begin the process of spinning our wheels. Um, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack made an announcement on July of 2014 in Farmsville, California that the United States um, Department of Agriculture would be providing $9.7 million in emergency water assistance to 73,000 individuals uh, or residents in 11 counties of California who are experience the dry, experiencing the driest year on record. Um, and in a statement, Valsic said, um, the emergency water grants that we are announcing today are triple the amount that we committed to when President Obama and I visited the state earlier this year. Um, and the city of Farmsville, California is also receiving a, a $500,000 emergency community water assistance grant program grant um, to construct pipelines connecting Cameron Creek Colony to, farm, to the Farmsville water main. Um, and linking residents to the water system, which provides much needed relief. Um, and in addition to the millions in emergency aid and grants that are being spent, 57 counties are being designated as disaster areas, and that's at 58 counties in California, um, which makes farmers eligible for emergency loans, which just further increases the financial burden or the financial stress on dr uh, drought relief. In California spending this immense amount of money on crisis relief for its citizens, but ultimately all of this money is not going towards a lasting solution. Um, this is why I said that we are spinning our wheels. Financial resources are arguably one of the most important resources in drought recovery, um, next to water, obviously. Um, imagine if we use this money and energy preemptively rather than um, in crisis. It's incredibly attainable to create water conservation systems that will help California and places alike prepare for impending droughts and reduce the impact that they have on public safety and health. Um, and this brings me to the importance of education. In a study done by Luis Bensworth, um, who's affiliated with the Public Policy Institute of California and Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Surveys, um, she sent surveys out to 61 departments, uh, Department of Public Health in California. Um, and when asked if they felt that their agency had adequate resources to respond to the potential public health risks associated with climate change, 68% of respondents said no. And in addition, when they were asked whether they felt they had adequate information to respond to climate-related emergencies, 70% answered that they felt they did not. Um, so these results are shocking. 
Um, if agencies whose purpose it is to protect its people both preemptively and in crisis don't know how to effectively react in a climate change crisis, both because they don't feel that they have adequate resources, which is a slightly different issue at certain times, but also because they don't feel they have the information to do that, how can we expect that there will be water conservation efforts taken to prepare for these droughts that we know are coming? Um, there's a blatant lack of knowledge and education around climate change and its dangers, uh, particularly around droughts, and the importance of water con conservation, um, both among the general population, but also the agencies that serve our communities. Um, a paper prepared by the California Energy Commission's California Climate Change Center, which is titled Climate Change and Water Supply Security, Reconfiguring Groundwater Management to Reduce Drought Vulnerability, um, proposes that the development and maintenance of locally-based groundwater drought reserves can improve water supply security during extreme droughts. And the emphasis is on um, groundwater recharge, storage, and the establishment of high quality buffers to reduce drought vulnerability. And the recovery of this water when there is a short term demand um, can occur and is manageable as long as these reserves are maintained. And that's the key, that during, cri uh, during crisis like, or during critically dry years, groundwater is the lifeline for so many communities um, in regions that are experiencing drought. And while the state is providing some funding to the development of more sustainable groundwater practices and management, no program has been established um, or implemented that proactively addresses the use of groundwater drought reserves to, um, for drought management. Um, and so California's drought has depleted um, a, a large amount of their groundwater reserves. Um, so here's uh, an image that demonstrates the groundwater level change um, in the state of California. So where you see a lot of the orange and red, that's where they've lost anywhere from 25 to 50 feet um, in groundwater level, which is pretty massive. Um, pretty and then on this next one, this shows um, the number of new wells that have been drilled, like deeper wells that have been drilled. So the places that are brightest red, so right there in the Central Valley of California, they've drilled more than 250 um, new wells just in the course of nine months. Um, so these methods are not sustainable. Casey has shown us the terrifying reality of impending drought, but she's also shown us um, the impact that can be made on reducing the severity of those predictions by taking strong and immediate action now. Investing in programs that will sustain groundwater reserves and prepare for a drought um, is one of the most important resources that we can invest in. So now is the time when we need to ask ourselves an important question. Are we going to continue to use water resources in the same way that we have been for decades and simply react when we are in crisis? If there's anything you should take away from this presentation, it is this. If UCSEC want to be reelected, take drought seriously and listen to what our panel has just presented before you. You don't want to be known as the officials who led this country into the worst drought you have ever seen. Uh, severe widespread drought is going to occur. We know that it's going to be severe. Serious economic effects are already felt in poor impacted areas. Resources will soon be depleted and the entire country will be feeling the effects um, of this drought. Collaboration is crucial to establish and implement steps that are proactive, not reactive, in order to re reduce the severity of the issue. Um, and ultimately, we need a bigger push for mass education around water conservation in order cr to create collaborative communities um, who will work together to develop and use resources efficiently um, before disaster strikes. Thank you. Okay.